please welcome CEO Intercontinental Hotels Group, Keith Barr, in discussion with Skift Senior Hospitality Editor, Diana Ting. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, so, I, Keith Barr needs very little introduction, but I'm going kind. to give you an introduction anyway. <laughs> um, Keith Barr has served as the CEO of IHG since July 2017, so it's coming up on your two-year anniversary. Um, and he's been a hospitality industry veteran for more than 25 years. Uh, under Keith's leadership at IHG, the company has added a total of four brands, a uh, soon-to-be fifth one, very soon, which you may give us some details about, um, and as well has made significant investments in digital technology. Uh, so before I begin to ask Keith a ton of questions, uh, I want to remind the audience that you too can ask Keith a bunch of questions of your own. Uh, so feel free to use the app and submit your questions for him that we'll get to at the end of the conversation, or you can also go to slido.com uh, forward slash skift. Um, so Keith, thank you so much Thanks for, for being having here. Me. Um, so first question for you, when is IHG buying a core? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've been with the company now for quite a long time. And so every few years we're going to be bought and then it doesn't happen. Then we're going to be bought and then we're going to buy a core. You know, it's a fascinating time in the industry, right? I mean, as we were talking earlier on, we've seen a lot of consolidation happen uh, over the last five to seven years. And really, you've seen the industry begin to bifurcate. Right. And so you think about the top five global hotel companies today have about 25% of existing room supply, but 60% of the pipeline. So the industry is becoming more branded, uh, and that's happening through organic growth in terms of launching new brands and through acquisitions and M&A. And, uh, of course, the big deal was, of course, Marriott Starwood, but then you had Accor buying Fairmont Raffles and, 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 and. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, and we've been very focused on kind of balancing the two things out, which is organic growth through launching new brands and segments and then all through inorganic through acquiring uh, Regent and then most recently Six Senses. And so, uh, you know, I can never comment about specific M&A, uh, but there's always going to be speculation because this scale does really matter in this industry. And what's most important about scale, I think, is the ability to invest in the technology platforms you need to compete going forward, which when I look at the, the companies that we've acquired, the small ones, really unique brands, um, really special cultures they've created, struggling to get to that next level of scale. So when we bought Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants in the US a few years ago, gr great brand, leading position in boutique in the US, <clears throat> really couldn't move international, didn't have a platform for growth internationally, which is what we could bring to the table. Somebody with six senses, you know, an incredible luxury resort brand, um, getting bigger and bigger and saying, do they have the, the infrastructure and the enterprise? And so I think what, what drives M&A is the importance of scale. And um, I'm happy to say we've got enough scale for today to be happy doing what we're doing. Yeah, so do you definitely anticipate a lot more consolidation going forward? You know, I think there will be over time um, some of these really unique small brands that have been launched out there in the last five to seven years, which are now getting to a reasonable level of scale where there will be attractive M&A opportunities for one of the big global hotel companies who will say, you know, that brand fits a gap in my portfolio where I don't currently have a product at that price point. Mm -hmm. Somebody has gone to the effort of building it and developing it and growing it, um, and they'll monetize it. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, most of the small companies will run into that, well, I can't get much bigger on my existing platform, um, but I can monetize this investment. And um, so I think you'll see that happen for years to come. Do you personally want to see IHG sort of regain its title as the world's largest hotel company, or are you happy with where it's at right now at the moment? No, I mean, you know, I'm really happy with where we're at. I think that, um, you know, somebody asked me, do you want to be the biggest? And I said, I want to be the best. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to make sure that both in terms of the brand portfolio we offer, the customer experience, the Cauley experience, we continue to improve to be one of the best hotel companies out there in the industry. And so what we focused on in the last two years was making some cultural shifts, you know, becoming a much more agile organization, moving much quicker than we used to in the past in terms of 
product innovation, technology acquisitions, um, and, and retooling the group to do that. So, you know, I think you mentioned we'll have five brands either launched or acquired in two years. Um, that's more than we did in the previous decade or two. Right. And so, you know, we want to have a culture within the company that is recognizing with everything changing so quickly around us, you can't work in a traditional, linear, static, planning sort of way. You've got to be very agile out there, reacting to changes in technology. I mean, even this morning we were talking. Mm -hmm. <coughs> An announcement from Marriott yesterday, moving into home sharing in the US. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The other day, Airbnb, you know, basically getting into a hotel space at Rockefeller Center. I mean, what does that mean? Every single day, there is a bit of news that is changing what's happening in this industry. And so you have to have an organization that's fit for purpose to work in that, that in a more agile environment. All right, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about uh, Marriott's entry into home sharing. And I think we've, we've actually discussed this before in previous yeah. conversations, but what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that there's a place for that for, for traditional hotel companies like IHG? Marriott to enter that space? Yeah, I mean, actually, I was in New York a couple weeks ago, um, and I was at a meeting with Arnie, and he was talking about kind of they piloted it in, the, in Europe. And this is slightly different, though. I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at it, what they've done, and again, I haven't spent a lot of time, just read it this morning, um, it's basically a distribution platform for loyalty members. And so, you know, it's, it's slightly different than a curated experience, I think. It's not uh, like a one fine stay. Um, does it make sense? You know, for us, we've looked at it three years ago. Um, you know, we decided that we had more than enough organic growth opportunities as a company and launching new brands and also investing in our technology platforms that we didn't see it being a huge growth vehicle for us. I think, um, you know, when you peel it back, and again, I don't want to speak for Marriott and I wouldn't think to speak for Arnie ever, um, but it is, you know, it's interesting. It's 2,000 homes being sold. They're, they're, they're a distribution platform. Those homes will be probably be on Airbnb and they'll be booking on home away. Uh, booking home away. So, I mean, sort of they're just another channel. Um, it's not a bad idea. I mean, because loyalty members do stay in hotels regularly. And on certain stay occasions, they will stay in a home. And so if you can find a way to connect your members on doing that, that makes sense. It's not a bad decision. Yeah, that sort of fits into another question I had for you, which is it seems like a lot of travel brands um, today want to sort of be end-to-end -end platforms, right? They have that whole end-to-end -end platform concept or experience platform concept. Um, they want to be like the one travel brand that anyone would ever possibly need. Do you see that being a role that IHG can fill eventually? Or do you want IHG to be that someday? I'm trying to think in any industry where there is just only one brand right. and one single source for anything. And there probably is out there. I can't think off the top of my head. I think that's what's the amazing thing about this industry is that there is room for multiple large companies and small companies who can offer unique products and experiences um, to customers around the world. I think what we're all trying to do is making sure that we're not giving a reason for a, a, a loyal customer today to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when people ask me, why are you doing the things you're doing? So I'm doing shareholder meetings this week and they say, well, why did you buy Six Senses? Why are you launching another new brand in the US in two weeks? I say, I never want to give a reason for a customer that's an owner or a guest to have to go work with a competitor. And so if I don't have a brand in that segment, effectively I'm pushing an owner or a guest to go stay with a competitor. And so I never want to do that. If I'm not offering an experience that a customer wants through a partnership, I'm pushing them to go someplace else. And so I think what we're all trying to do is stay more connected with our owners and our guests across the entirety of the journey, across all the price points and segments, to make sure we maximize the, our relationship with them. Um, and so that's why I think you're seeing it happen. Yeah, I, I seem to ask <clears throat> this question all the time of, of people in the, the hotel industry, but how many brands is too many brands? <laughs> uh, I think you can have too many brands, mm -hmm. because I think if you have brands which don't truly mean something, and so that aren't clearly differentiated in terms of the experience and the price point and the promise and the proposition you're making to a guest. It's just a sign on a building. And I think you have to work harder today than ever before to make sure your brands really stand for something and that, and that promise is incredibly important. Um, 
because yeah, I could launch 10 more brands tomorrow. I mean, I you know, have a, a long list of names that we've done <clears throat> IP registration searches for, and I could come up with a nice tagline and throw it onto a hotel. It doesn't mean anything. And so I think you have to make sure that you're really investing the time and effort into it. And, that, and the only way you're gonna create value for owners is by having brands that guests are willing to show a preference for mm -hmm. and pay a premium for too. And so you have to be thoughtful about it. I mean, we spent, so Avid is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we spent a year in customer research before we decided to go and launch that brand, really understanding the segment. What were those core customer needs? Why were they being underserviced today by the existing hotels that were out there? How could we win in that segment? Um, before we even decided to go approve to go ahead and launch it. Now we've got 170 hotels signed in the first 18 to 20 months, and that will be our next big brand of scale. Mm -hmm. you know, that will be the next Holiday Inn Express for us right. uh, because of the potential that that market segment has. Right. But we worked really hard at it uh, versus just going out there and throwing a, you know, a smaller room with a name on it. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell us about this new brand that you plan to launch in about two weeks, <coughs> the, this all sweet brand? Yeah, I'm excited about it. So we have our um, mainstream owners conference in the United States in a couple of weeks in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. So I'll be there with a few thousand of our closest owner friends on uh, GM, uh, and we'll be launching that brand. Um, we've seen tremendous growth in the all sweet segment uh, in the US. It's very appealing um, because it fits a unique niche between the traditional extended stay and the traditional, let's call it, select service experience. You have guests who are not staying 14 to 21 nights, but who are not just there for 1.3 average length of stay. You're looking at three, four, five nights stay, want a bit more space, um, want a slightly different level of service and experience, so somewhere in between. We didn't have a product out there to do that, but it is one of the fastest growing segments in the US. Very strong pricing premiums um, and, and, and on economics. I'm excited about it. I, I actually, they try to keep me out of the design world um, <laughs> because of my, uh, some of you know my past job, I was in the marketing organization here, so I have def definitive views on everything. Um, so they usually give it to me after it's all been done so I can't change anything, um, which is pretty smart. Um, it's great. It's a, it's a really nice design. It's got a real sense of, um, it, it, it's, it's contemporary, but it is, it's comfortable. It gives you a sense of place, a sense of space, lay, layout that gives you functional areas. Mm -hmm. um, so is it a competitor to home sharing in some sense? You know what? We do believe that's why the segment has actually taken off so much, mm -hmm. is that it gives you a different physical experience in a traditional hotel room, which was being met by home sharing in some instances, of people wanting some base level of kitchen services, dining areas, work areas versus just bed. Um, so the design's quite nice, the social spaces are quite nice, so it gives you that sense of com communal spaces as well too. So um, we'll come out in I said, two, two weeks or so with the whole complete design package, name, brand proposition. So my next question is a bit of like a an existential crisis for the hotel industry question. Oh no. But I, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago with uh, Ted Tang, who had just mm -hmm. retired um, as CEO of Leading Hotels of the World. And he told me that he, there's one thing that he sort of regrets about um, what the hotel industry has become. It's that he laments the fact that it's been become an, an industry that is, quote, one of opportunists and not of innovators. Uh, that it's essentially the fact that hotel companies have, quote, like, put their brands up for rent, and they thereby lost the ownership and distribution of their actual hotels uh, to the point where it's become a commodity. Um, essentially, it's become a franchise business. <laughs> and as a CEO of one of the largest franchise hotel company businesses in the world, I wanted to ask you, you know, do you sort of agree or disagree, and do you think there's a way to sort of inspire the industry to be more innovative and not just follow? I, I think if you go back to the story curve that was up earlier on, the industry's going through, I think, a unique period of being more innovative now. Um, I think that there was a traditional approach which was um, mainstream brands, franchised, upscale luxury brands will manage those, uh, grow the existing portfolio. I think you have seen us become much more innovative in technology and how we think about it. I think that we're launching new brands, but I also think the role of companies is changing 
um, and something that you and I haven't talked about, but I was reflecting on a few recent conversations I've had with some other CEOs that you're seeing in society today, um, this is a, a, a personal view, a bit of a loss of belief in government. And so you're seeing rising nationalism, a loss of belief in government, and an expectation today that corporations are gonna become more of a force for good. And that you're expected from our customer base and our colleague base, which I think is causing us to become more innovative about how we engage with communities in the social responsibility space, in the community space, the education space. In the past, it was a do no harm approach, which was you, you have your CSR platform, you're going out and doing all the right things you're, to be a good company. Today, I think that customer expectations are changing faster than government regulations. Plastics is a good example, where, where companies are going to have to get out in front of legislation because that's what customers expect, that they're going to have to be a force for good and helping impact society, where governments are struggling to do it. And so you know, my internal conversation with my executive team is fundamentally different today than four years ago. And things that we're talking about going, how can we have a material impact on society? It's good for business too, don't get me wrong, but our colleagues expect it. So I'll give you an example. The other day we announced uh, just a slight change in our volunteering program. And we told all of our colleagues globally in the corporate office around the world, you can have two more days of paid leave annually to go volunteer in the communities we operate. And it's been incredibly well received because in the past people were taking personal time off or not being able to do things they thought would benefit the community. And it doesn't cost us that much money, but it has a huge impact on our people and their engagement in the community. And we have to do more and more of those things. You look at a company like Six Senses we bought, I mean, they've put a stake in the ground about being a positive impact for good much further than, any, than we are today. I mean, they, they have an aspiration to be plastic free through their supply chain mm -hmm. by 2021. And I'm now going to go, okay, now that's one of my brands. How do I get the rest of my brands on a similar trajectory? And so what are we going to do about single-use amenities? How can we get those out of all of our hotel brands in the near term? And so I think he's, he's going back to the question. Ted is right in that we've gotten really big and we don't own all the hotels. But I think we are being innovative in other ways today, which will hopefully have more impact on society. Yeah. Let's talk about innovation at IHG. Um, You've invested quite heavily in technology innovation at the company, um, and you've also invested heavily in attribute-based booking. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that going to fundamentally change how people interact with, with IHG and with, with hotels going forward? It's, it's a great question. Um, I think it's, a, it's what is the role of technology in the customer journey going forward for? And there's probably, um, probably three areas I think of about technology. One is going to be about um, the, how, how does technology automate the guest service experience without removing the human element? So how does, it, how does it become enabler there? Then there's going to be the whole personalization which gets overused, but the utilization of data and analytics to help tailor the customer experience, which is part of what the reservation system will do. Um, and I, and I think the last aspect is, 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 is platforms as well, too, in terms of how those platforms then connect everything that happens throughout the hotel stay. So when we've invested heavily the last couple of years, I would say in, in two big platforms. One is IHG Connect, which is effectively is our global Wi-Fi infrastructure which doesn't sound very sexy and exciting, but it's core to everything you're gonna to have to do going forward to have a connected journey. And so it's getting that platform right in all of your hotels. Now we're at, I think, close to 4,000 out of 5,600. Um, that, you know, it, when I walk into the hotel, it recognizes me for who I am. I, one click, I'm in the Wi-Fi. But it knows exactly where I am in the hotel at any given point. It knows when I go to my hotel room and connect me to my TV. And certain, and so that will enable us to do a connected journey through the entire hotel stay. It's a lot of heavy lifting to get that done because it's just a platform. Now it's about how do you leverage it. The other big platform clearly is GRS, mm -hmm. attribute selling. And that, I think, is the future of the industry, of moving away from rates and room types to, you know, what are you looking for in your stay? You're not, you're not necessarily looking for a non-smoking king. 
you're looking for, hey, I want a, a great bread on a high floor with this sort of view, with these sorts of amenities, and it's not smoking. Mm -hmm. um, all hotels are not smoking now anyway. So um, how do you, then how do you price that? And making sure that we can, you know, can drive incremental revenue, but also incremental volume, depending upon how we balance that out. And so um, we've got phase one deployed, uh, attribute, selling goes into um, pilot on uh, next quarter and roll out in 2020, um, which will be a huge step forward for us. And then it's working with our partner Amadeus to just release new functionality, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter um, and really leverage it. So I'm excited about those two platforms because they're the bedrock on which we can build an incredible customer experience going forward for the next decade. Mm -hmm. And do you sort of see attribute-based booking as kind of a an advantage in terms of getting of, of taking back your distribution control? I think it will, because effectively what you can do is for, you can choose what inventory you distribute through what channel. And so somebody who is the very price conscious, leisure traveler, non-brand loyal, you distribute to an OTA, you don't do full attributes, but for that really loyal customer who wants the full experience, um, then you kind of sell it that way. We're going to go to some audience sure. questions. So our first question is, does scale destroy brand DNA and uniqueness? It absolutely can. <laughs> yeah, without question. How, how do you sort of prevent that? Um, I think it requires a lot of discipline. I mean, I was quoted this morning. I saw an article, and I actually was, was, was a bit tired when I did it. I talked about buying six senses. And I, and I said, we bought six senses. And I said, it has a really special culture, which is sort of DNA. And I said, our goal was not to screw it up. And they quoted me directly, um, which I wasn't intending for that to happen. Um, you have to be conscious about how do you ring fence the things that make brands special and unique and create the culture. And I, and I think um, we've done a really good job with like Kimpton. I think we've done a nice job. We'll do a great job. We've learned from Kimpton what we'll do with Six Senses. I think it's actually causing me to think about how do I strengthen the culture of my existing brands even more so than before. And so. I think if you believe you can just take a brand and plug it into your system and just treat it like another product in its entirety, um, it, especially in the luxury boutique space, you're wrong. I mean, so I, I still run Kimpton Hotels and Restaurants out of San Francisco. So they're a separate office, a separate development, operations, sales and marketing, design. Um, Six Senses is still run at Bangkok. I was there a few weeks ago, down meeting with the team, and they're all still doing all the work there. So I think you have to recognize they can be powered by the IHG enterprise, which is behind the scenes, but you can maintain that special culture and way of working. Right. Our next question is, uh, talking end to end, is there potential for hotel groups to create more loyalty and challenge the airlines in creating a better airport lounge experience? Or because it's sort of like the fundamental question of our hotels becoming a little bit more like the airlines in terms of how they sell and how do they, they interact and how loyal customers are to them. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think if it's about airport lounges, um, they're all trying to raise their game now. Yeah. So, I mean, my conversation I've had with all the CEOs there, they feel that they're in a, now into a um, product and lounge experience mm -hmm. Everybody's having to raise their game. Right. Uh, so the hotel lobby has existed for yeah. a very, very long time. <laughs> you know, I, th I think what's happened is happening in the social spaces and hotels is happening in the airline lounges is that customer expectations have just moved on mm -hmm. and the product have not kept pace with it. And so what was acceptable 10 years ago is now a dissatisfier to customers. If you walk into an old airport lounge now, and effectively, it's you know no PowerPoints in the right place. It's the same thing going into an old guest room. People are going to be dissatisfied, and so I think everyone's having to raise expectations. I think it's the hardest thing for airlines and for hotels because we have there's massive capital investments in physical assets with a with a with a, a useful life, and technology just moves on. And so I mean. I remember at one time, one of our brands, you know, we installed, we were an early adopter on a piece of technology, which we spent a bunch of time and money deploying around the world in the, in the early 90s, and it was regarding Wi-Fi. And by the time we got it deployed, it was already out of date. You know, and so it's making sure how do you invest intelligently in those spaces to give you the flexibility and the agility you need to, um, to change going forward. Right. So we have time for one more question. Um, 
And the next one is, what are your thoughts on the future of content and pricing distribution via travel management companies? Um, do you see a similar trend as you do with the airlines? Like, what's, what's IHG's sort of relationship to, to travel management companies? This is more of a corporate travel-based question. Yeah, um, we have great, great relationship with travel management companies. And I think the relationship with the OTAs are changing for all the hotel mm -hmm. companies, too. I think people are recognizing that there has to be a more symbiotic relationship there. What I think you will find the hotel industry doing more so going forward is understanding the value of the content, understanding where and how you distribute that content to get more control of pricing and distribution. I think the industry in general has been a bit lax in terms of understanding. It's been very egalitarian in terms of either we don't control the content or we distribute the same content everywhere, which doesn't give you that selectivity that you need. And I think that will change going forward. Well, thank you so much, Keith, for being with us. Um, it was always great to chat with you. Great. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much.